Okay, I think the mic is on now. All right, well, uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to come to this beautiful place. I've been really enjoying all the talks so far. And uh, I would like to talk about um, boundary and oh, yeah. boundary and plane defect criticality in the 3D ON model. Um, so I have to apologize from the very beginning that there will not be very much quantum in my talk, but there will be uh, criticality. So let me uh, begin by uh, explaining what do I mean by boundary criticality. So imagine you have some uh, bulk system that is tuned to the bulk uh, critical point, and for definiteness, let's assume that is described by conformal field theory. And suppose I want to study this system. Uh, in the presence of a boundary. For instance, I might be interested in uh, correlation functions of uh, operators on the boundary or mixed correlation functions involving correlators, uh, involving operators on the boundary and in the bulk. So that's the problem. Uh, and there are a few general uh, things that can be said right away. The first is that uh, in general, the operator spectrum on the boundary is distinct from that uh, in the bulk. So operators on the boundary have scaling dimensions delta hat, which are distinct from the scaling dimensions in the bulk, and their fusion rules are also uh, distinct and so forth. So that's the first comment. Uh, second comment is that given a bulk universality class, the boundary universality class uh, is not unique. Um, there can be distinct uh, boundary universality classes corresponding to the same bulk universality class, and you can tune between those boundary universality classes by changing the details of the Hamiltonian near the surface. And we will see some uh, examples uh, very shortly. Now, uh, you know, th this problem of boundary criticality is very old. It goes at least to the 70s and 80s, where it was considered uh, in the context of uh, classical stat Mac. Um, but there's been renewed interest in this problem uh, coming uh, mainly from two directions. The first um, is um, just improved understanding of uh, conformal field theories um, coming in part from uh, the numerical conformal bootstrap program. The other direction is from topological phases. So we know that topological phases are gapped in the bulk. They have a finite correlation length and they often host uh, some kind of protected boundary state. And for a very long time, you know, think of, I don't know, topological insulator or something. For a very long time, it was thought that uh, the protection of the boundary state uh, relies crucially on the bulk being gapped. But later it was understood that there are some cases where actually the uh, boundary, the boundary mode survives in some form, even when the bulk gap closes. And this goes under the name of gapless topological phases. And such gapless topological phases are often quite, uh, quite difficult um, to, quite challenging to understand. Um, you know, they, they lie uh, squarely in the domain of this boundary, boundary criticality. So uh, my, my, my interest in the subject came from, uh, from the direction of this uh, gapless topological phases and of course quantum. Um, quantum states of matter, 
but uh, today I'll uh, I'll be mostly talking about just classical stat Mac model where I realized that something has been some important uh, qualitative aspects have been missed uh, in the literature. And in fact, I'll be talking about the simplest uh, classical stat Mac model there is, which is the uh, classical ON model, right? So um, I will be mostly considering bulk dimension, which is three. Um, and so, so this is a cubic, cubic lattice, and there are classical spins that is length one classical vectors sitting on the um, sides of this lattice. They have N components, and they're coupled with nearest neighbor ferromagnetic uh, interaction. And I want to consider two geometries, uh, a semi-infinite geometry where there is a there is a boundary, and uh, I will allow the coupling uh, on the boundary to be distinct from the coupling uh, in the bulk. Um, and the second geometry is this plane defect geometry, where uh, I in, instead of a boundary I have a defect plane, and again I allow the exchange coupling between spins on the plane to be distinct from the um, from the coupling in the bulk. So I'd like to understand the phase diagram of this uh, of this system. Let's begin with the with uh, this case of a, a semi-infinite geometry. Well, um, if the bulk dimension D is greater than three, then the um, phase diagram is essentially understood. So, uh, well, first of all, in the, what is the phase diagram in the bulk? There is a paramagnetic phase at high temperature. There is a paramagnetic ordered phase uh, at a low temperature, and there is a critical temperature Tc here. Now let's ask what happens uh, on the boundary. Well, if the surface coupling K1, if the surface exchange coupling is not too large, then the boundary will order at the same uh, temperature as the bulk. And this is known as the ordinary boundary universality class. However, if you make the surface coupling large enough, um, then um, the surface can order at a higher temperature than the bulk. So as we lower the temperature, first we go into a phase where the surface is already ordered and the bulk is still disordered. And then uh, subsequently, once we reach the bulk critical temperature, the bulk orders um, in the presence of an already ordered surface. So this is known as the extraordinary boundary universality class. And finally, there is this, there is this multi-critical point known as the special boundary universality class. Each of these classes is a distinct boundary universality class corresponds to a distinct boundary conformal field theory. Um, all the exponents are different for, the, for them and so forth. All right, so this is the situation in dimension greater than three, and it's largely understood, yes? Can you clarify where a sub Where? Uh, I believe it's actually here, uh, but uh, it, it's not it's not very important. This critical value, of course, will depend on dimensionality, and it's order one. Um, yeah. Uh, the extraordinary phase larger than the well, sorry. What? Oh. So, so there was a. Wait, can I close this? Um, well, maybe here. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so I think the the question was uh, what is whether the uh, critical temperature in the extraordinary regime is larger than uh, than the bulk critical temperature. So there are two critical temperatures here, right? There is a temperature at which the surface orders and it is higher. Than... Okay, let's let's try that. Um, yes, uh, and then there is a temperature at which the bulk orders, right? So, so the, this these two temperatures are different. No, I mean the temperature at which bulk orders in extraordinary version. 
No, it's the same, same temperature, right? Because this is some bulk property. You can think about or the parameter very, very far away from the boundary. And when that or the parameter acquires an expectation value, this is the bulk phase transition. It doesn't really care about what happens on the boundary. But boundary kind of acts as a ex external because boundary already ordered. In the thermodynamic limit, no. In the finite size system, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is what happens in three dimensions. There is one more um, interesting point, which is that so far I've considered the uh, situation when there is no symmetry breaking field, either on the boundary or in the bulk. Now let's let's imagine that you actually break the symmetry on the boundary by applying a magnetic field uh, on the boundary. Well, then it's believed that you have just one boundary universality class for any value of the uh, boundary exchange coupling. And this is the so-called normal universality class. Don't ask me. Uh, well, actually, th these names have a history going back to um, um, criticality in fluids. Uh, but so this is the nomenclature. And um, it turns out uh, that if the bulk dimension D is greater than three, then uh, the extraordinary universality class here without the symmetry breaking field is uh, essentially the same as the normal universality class. That is, it doesn't matter whether you break the symmetry on the boundary explicitly or spontaneously. Once you have a boundary or the parameter, you essentially have the same universality class of the transition. So this is uh, essentially understood. Now, the interesting thing is what happens if the bulk is three-dimensional? So this will be the subject of my talk. And well, if uh, you have Ising spins, then um, essentially the same story goes through. Uh, you have a same phase diagram. You have the surface phase transition uh, where the two-dimensional surface undergoes an Ising, two-dimensional Ising transition. Everything, everything essentially the same. Now, if you have XY spins, that is n equal to two, the situation is already more interesting uh, because you know that in two dimensions you cannot have a true long range order you can only have quasi long range order so this phase here at large uh, surface um, exchange um, is a quasi long range ordered phase and this green line is a two-dimensional costal stylus transition so now you ask the question okay what happens when the bulk orders out of this uh, surface phase with quasi long range order. And it turns out, yes, Leon? Well, well, yeah, the, 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 the question from Leon is uh, when I say extraordinary transition, whether I am referring to transition on the boundary or transition in the bulk. And well, this extraordinary transition is exactly when the bulk is tuned to the bulk critical point. So the bulk has an infinite correlation length here. And I'm interested in calculating correlators on the boundary or involving or, or, or you know involving both the boundary and the bulk when the bulk is already critical. Right? So it's a boundary in the gapless system if you wish. Yeah. Nothing? The bulk Definitely. If if the symmetry is broken in the bulk spontaneously, then of course you also have an order parameter on the boundary. But the scaling of that order parameter, you can ask if you go a little bit below T C here, how does the uh, boundary magnetization scale in T minus T C or T C minus T? And it will be a different exponent depending whether you are here or here or here even well it, it, once t is smaller than tc bulk magnetization induces a surface magnetization of course because just proximity proximity effect if you wish yeah good other, other questions okay so let's let's continue so so, so um this, the question is what happens along this orange line and in the vicinity of this orange line in this case and uh this question actually has not been answered in the literature. Um, there have been uh, some discussions and actually some, um, some suggestion that perhaps along this orange line, even though um, you don't have a long range order in the bulk, 
maybe the bulk fluctuations induce a true long range order on the surface. Um, no theorem against that, as far as we know. Uh, it would have been kind of an interesting way to bypass Norman Wagner. Uh, well, of course, Norman Wagner does not strictly apply here. But it turns out uh, what, what I showed is that doesn't quite happen. Although the system gets close to uh, long range order along this orange line, but uh, the spin spin correlation function on the boundary doesn't quite go to a constant. Instead, it decays very, very slowly as a power of logarithm of the separation along the boundary, and this power is universal. So I'll explain where this result comes from. It's a consequence of a randomization group analysis. So this is already kind of interesting, uh, but um, let's continue. Yeah, and I, I call this uh, extraordinary log universality class in order to distinguish it from the um, conventional extraordinary uh, class where the correlator on the boundary goes to a constant at large, at large separation. Okay, now let's discuss what happens when n is greater than two. So the, here yeah, you think maybe n equal three Heisenberg spins, right? So um, here we know that when the temperature is above the bulk critical temperature, the boundary, the two dimensional boundary will have a finite correlation length. You can have neither quasi long range nor uh, long range order. So it's con completely consistent that the phase diagram could look like this. with just a single boundary universality class, the ordinary universality class for um, any surface exchange K1. However, it's also not ruled out that you could have um, two distinct stable boundary universality classes uh, and the special transition between them, even though all of this would connect to the same uh, phases above and below uh, the bulk critical temperature. So which of these two scenarios is, is realized? And uh, you know, if you look at the literature, um, I think people assume that this minimal scenario has to be has to be real. Well, that turns out to be wrong. Turns out that the answer depends on the value of uh, n. If n is large but finite, indeed this minimal scenario uh, is realized. However, let's uh, be theorists and let's treat n um, as a continuous parameter. Then turns out that when n is slightly above two, you can show convincingly that the second scenario here is realized and you have the extraordinary log universality class where again the spin spin correlation function on the boundary decays uh, in this logarithmic manner. Um, you might say oh what is this limit uh, n is really an integer well um, from numerics it looks like it seems pretty convincing that n equal three is actually in this regime and I'll, I'll discuss that uh, shortly. Yeah. So let's discuss where all of these results come from. And they come from the following renormalization group analysis. So what you would like to understand is what happens in the regime when uh, the surface coupling K1 is large. Um, that is, um, there is a possibility of some kind of extraordinary phase. And uh, well, in this regime, there is a very strong tendency in the surface layer towards local, at least local um, magnetic order. So let's discuss, describe the surface layer by the following nonlinear sigma model, two dimensional nonlinear sigma model, and the coupling G will be small when uh, K1 is large. And before we, of course, the, the, the interesting question is what happens when this two dimensional surface layer is coupled to the bulk fluctuations? Um, but before we answer that question, let's, let's remind ourselves, if we just had a purely two-dimensional layer, what, what would happen? What is the IR fate of this theory? And um, we know very well, Polyakov has taught us that this coupling constant G, even if it starts out small, in the infrared, it runs to infinity, and this signals the appearance of a finite correlation length in accordance with Norman Wagner theory. Okay. So how is, the, now the real question is, how is this RG flow modified when we couple uh, the surface layer to the rest to the rest of the system? So let's try to answer that question. So this is the action for the surface layer. 
then for the rest of the system, the rest of the system is going to be described just by the uh, well bulk or three model with the ordinary uh, fixed point boundary fixed point, and finally there will be some coupling between the uh, between the order parameter n in the top layer and uh, the boundary field um, of the remaining of the remaining system. So that's this that's this coupling, and um, well, let's let's work around the fixed point with uh, g equal to zero. Um, so it's weak coupling, and uh, let's actually begin by just by just freezing the fluctuations of this surface order parameter. So g strictly zero. Then this surface order parameter, of course, acts just as a symmetry breaking field for the rest of the system, boundary symmetry breaking field. And as I told you, the system will flow to what, what, what I call the normal uh, boundary fixed point. Right? Remember, normal boundary fixed point is one where I apply a symmetry, explicit symmetry breaking field on the boundary. And uh, interestingly, a lot is actually known about this uh, normal boundary fixed point. In particular, um, we know leading operators appearing in the operator product expansion of the bulk or the parameter, right? So imagine I take a bulk or the parameter and I take it close to the boundary, I should be able to expand it in terms of boundary operators. And this is this bulk to boundary operator product expansion. And I have to distinguish between components of the bulk field parallel and perpendicular to the symmetry breaking field on the surface. So I take the symmetry breaking field on the surface to be along the nth direction. So then the component phi n, well, it should acquire some profile, right? Some expectation value away from the, from the boundary. And it's a power law uh, profile just given by the bulk exponent of phi. And uh, so the identity operator appears here in the operator product expansion uh, of phi n. And uh, the next operator, is believed to be so-called displacement operator, which has a protected dimension of exactly three, doesn't get renormalized. And for the transverse components of the um, or the parameter, um, the, leading, the leading operator here again turns out to be a protected operator, which has a scaling dimension of exactly two. This protected operator uh, is an n minus o n minus one vector, and uh, we call it the tilt operator all right so these are these are known facts now these coefficients a b and b uh, actually are universal once you normalize your bulk and boundary operators appropriately we don't know these uh, coefficients exactly but uh, we have some knowledge about them from large n expansion from monte carlo and from um and from numerical conformal bootstrap that i'll describe later Okay, so this is the normal fixed point, right? So this is what happens when I just freeze, um, when I just freeze the fluctuations of this uh, field n. Now I'd like to make the coupling constant g of the nonlinear sigma model uh, finite, small but finite, and allow for fluctuations of n. Well, so there are these fluctuations phi of n, and well, naturally these fluctuations will have to couple to the to the operators of the normal boundary fixed point um, that I introduced that I introduced here, and uh, in fact, <laughs> the only coupling that you can write down is this coupling phi dot t, where remember t is appears in the operator product expansion of the transverse component of uh, bulk or the parameter. Uh, okay, so so this is actually the action I'll consider. Now you might say there's this is there is something very strange here. You start with an ON invariant action, and then you work around a fixed point where n, you know, which um, which breaks the ON symmetry to ON minus one. So you don't have explicit ON symmetry anymore. You only have explicit ON minus one symmetry. So how to restore the ON symmetry? Where is the ON symmetry hiding? And it turns out that the ON symmetry actually fixes the value of this parameter s to be expressed uh, in terms of the universal constants in the appearing in the OPE. So S is not a free parameter, but is rather fixed like this. And there is a rather simple argument for this, which is again, you know, imagine you freeze the fluctuations of N, 
and take n to point along the north pole, well, then the bulk order parameter, the, uh, the expectation value of the bulk order parameter will also point along the north pole. Now, what happens if you rotate the surface field a little bit? The bulk field should also rotate just by own symmetry, but uh, so, so it should acquire a profile like this. Um, okay, but you should also be able, you know, if, if it's a small rotation, you should be able to do perturbation theory in pi um, to, to obtain the bulk uh, or the parameter profile. So it introduces to this correlator. This correlator turns out to be completely fixed by conformal symmetry up to the uh, uh, OPE coefficient BT. And then, uh, you know, doing this integral here, you get the relation that S is expressed in terms of A sigma and B. So this is, <laughs> this is the action I'll be considering then. Um, and uh, now we are in business and we can, you, you see there is only one uh, tunable parameter in this action, which is uh, the uh, coupling constant G of the nonlinear sigma model. So all that remains is just to compute the beta function of this uh, parameter G. And well, there is a contribution to the beta function just from the nonlinear sigma model that we discussed a little earlier, Polykov's contribution. And it's, you know, it's right here, this N minus two G squared. But there is a new contribution coupling to the, uh, coming from the coupling to the bulk. And it comes simply from this very simple diagram for the two point function of N. Why? Yeah. yeah, so I am working usual perturbation theory where I expand N around the North Pole. And this is the, um, yeah, good question. Right, so this diagram is very easy to compute. And what it does, it gives you a new contribution to the, uh, coefficient of the beta function of, of G squared term, which is uh, related to this coupling S. So now, uh, oh, and one, one more comment, the uh, anomalous dimension of the field N actually mm, remains the same as it was in the strictly 2D nonlinear sigma model, doesn't get affected by this coupling to the bulk to this order. Yes? Uh, then, you just expand you you use this expression for n and you expand the d mu n squared right so n has length one so that's why it's non-linear and that's why when you expand in pi you get this extra you get this extra yeah all right so now we are in business uh we just need to analyze the consequences of this renormalization group flow and the consequences just depend on the sign of alpha. Namely, if alpha is positive, then G will run to zero logarithmically in the infrared. This is like, you know, pi to the fourth theory in four dimensions. Um, and integrating this RG flow together with this uh, anomalous dimension for N, which is uh, order G, um, you exactly recover this uh, correlation function on the surface that decays as a power of logarithm and the power Q is given uh, in terms of alpha like this. All right, so this is my advertised extraordinary log fixed point. This is how to understand it. On the other hand, if alpha is less than zero, then we're kind of back to the situation similar to one we had exactly in uh, two dimension where the uh, G equals zero fixed point is unstable. Where does it flow to? Well, we, we will discuss shortly. All right, so the, the main question now becomes whether alpha is positive or negative. And for general values of N, I can give you an exact answer, but there are some limits that, that, that I understand. First, if N is equal to two, then um, the only contribution to alpha comes from this coupling to the bulk. And this contribution is manifestly positive. So for N equal to two, we definitely have the extraordinary log phase being realized. That's good because for n equal to two, remember the topology of the phase diagram, the KT transition required a separate extraordinary phase. And here we learned that this phase must be of the extraordinary log character. Uh, on the other hand, when n goes to infinity, um, we definitely alpha becomes negative. We can, can there, are, there are one, yeah, so for, for n going to infinity, I can compute this, um, a sigma and BT, this universal constants, you know, one over N expansion. And um, 
then uh, alpha is given by this expression, so it's negative. So alpha has to change sign as n increases from two to infinity, and uh, the minimal assumption, uh, which actually seems to be supported also by numerical conformal bootstrap that I'll show, is that um, alpha uh, changes sign just once at some uh, value n equal to um, nc. So then for n smaller than nc, the extraordinary log phase um, is realized for n greater than nc, we, we don't quite know what happens. All right, um, yes. So now um, this is, you know, um, this is uh, this is all theory, but uh, you know, can can we check this numerically? And actually, shortly after my, um, and, and of course, you know, the most interesting question is what is the value of n c, and in particular, is n equal three above n c or below? Because for n equal to two, we we know that we have to have the extraordinary log phase. For n equal to three, we don't we don't quite know. So shortly after my paper um, came out. There was a um, detailed study of the problem for n equal to three for the Heisenberg model by Francesca Paris and Tolden. And he actually found um, a special transition on the boundary by looking at the Binder ratio and extracted exponents, boundary exponents at the special transition. And he also studied the regime uh, of large surface coupling. Um, and in this regime, he found that uh, his numerics was consistent with the extraordinary log universality class. Uh, he, he, saw, sir, he saw, saw a stiffness that diverges logarithmically, which is exactly what one would expect um, for the extraordinary log class. And he also saw a, a two-point function that roughly uh, the case as a power of logarithm. And he actually extracted this, um, this power. And from this power, he extracted alpha. And this is the value of alpha that he got for n equal to three. Um, and then uh, this group, uh, Hu, Deng, and Uth, have uh, repeated also uh, the calculation for n equal to two for the xy model. And again, they found that for the large uh, surface exchange, the, um, the, the results were consistent with the extraordinary log universality class. And they extracted this uh, universal constant alpha and it's given here, 0 0.27. Okay. So this is, this is kind of nice. Uh, so in particular, it means that nc is greater than three, right? There is this extraordinary phase for n equal to three. <laughs> now, as you remember, a prediction of my theory was that this uh, number alpha should be given in terms of this uh, universal quantities a sigma and bt uh, for the normal boundary universality class. That is the universality class in a symmetry breaking field. So I uh, convinced Francesco to also do the simulations with the sim explicit symmetry breaking field on the boundary and extract this universal uh, coefficients. And after he did that, and you know took the took the ratio. This is this is what he obtained. So you see, actually, the agreement is quite good, uh, specific, especially given the fact that it's very hard to fit things to this power of log. So it's quite quite surprising that the agreement is, is so good. And then together with uh, Jay Padayasi, Abhijit Krishnan, Elia Grusberg, and Marco Maneri, we also studied the uh, normal boundary universality class using a numerical conformal bootstrap. And we also obtained estimates for this universal constants A sigma and BT, and, uh, and they're given they're given uh, here. So you see actually, um, you know, th th this is uh, not a super accurate method. It's not like the bootstrap one has in the bulk with the four point function, but uh, again, the agreement is actually not, not bad. And we expect the agreement to get better actually as n increases. So uh, from, this, um, from these calculations, well, here it looks like nc, we can, we, you know, we can put in any value of n. So it looks like here nc is of order is something like five. Actually, from, from more numerics, we believe it's probably somewhere between four and five. I think there is a question in the chat from yeah. Andre. Oh, I, I can also open it up actually here, probably. Question from me on the, on the slide. 
on the slide on the NC alpha by square. Why on the same slide? Yeah. So let, let me repeat the question. So Andre is asking about this alpha is given here, but also for n to infinity, I write it like this. So this result here comes from computing this A sigma and Vt in the large n limit, which can be done by studying the ON model with a symmetry breaking field on the boundary in the large n limit. And this is the result to first subleading order in one over n. There is there are also order, there, there are also even more subleading terms that I haven't included here. So this is only true for n going to infinity. Um, yeah, I hope that, that that clears things up. All right. So yeah, just to mention uh, this bootstrap work here uh, was done with was done with my wonderful collaborators who taught me all about numerical conformal bootstrap, Jay Padayazi, who is a graduate student of Ilya Grusberg at Ohio State, Marco Mineri, who was a postdoc at uh, Lausanne and now has moved uh, to a postdoc position in Geneva, and Abhi Krishnan is my graduate student at MIT. All right, so um, this, is, this is about um, values of NC. Now we can ask what happens as you cross NC? What happens as you get into this regime where alpha is negative? And uh, well, here the physics will be in the vicinity of NC, uh, the physics will be controlled by the next term in the beta function for G, right? Because the first term vanishes at n equal to NC. And the physics will depend on the sign of the subleading of the subleading term. So on the sign of B. And uh, well, there are two scenarios. Uh, if, if the sign is positive, then uh, what happens is we find an infrared unstable fixed point for n just below nc at weak coupling. And we expect that this fixed point just corresponds to the special transition between the extraordinary log phase and the ordinary phase that we know exists for n equal to two. And then we expect that it just continues, moves to weaker and weaker coupling until at n equal nc, it collides with the extraordinary log fixed point and annihilates. So that for n greater than nc, we only have the ordinary fixed point left. So this is the simplest scenario. Uh, if this uh, coefficient b is negative, this, the situation is more complicated, uh, namely this uh, extraordinary fixed point moves away from g equal to zero for uh, n slightly above nc, and then presumably it would have again to annihilate with a special fixed point at some yet larger value of, um, of n because at n equal infinity, we know that only the ordinary fixed point is left. Nevertheless, uh, uh, at this point, we cannot compute B for, um, for arbitrary value, value of N. So in principle, this scenario could be allowed. Now what we were, so, so what we want to know is B at N equal NC, and that's hard, but what we, yeah. So, so, so this is again, the picture for the two scenarios. Um, now in the N, and this is the K1, of a K plane, the red line is a special transition. Yeah. So we don't know the value of B at N equal to NC, but uh, actually recently we were able to calculate it together with uh, Abi in the N to infinity limit, and you see it's positive. So it's actually pointing towards this, towards this simple, simplest scenario. In fact, if you look just at a two-dimensional nonlinear sigma model, uh, it's given by this expression. So including the coupling to the bulk only makes it more positive. You see it's four thirds instead of, instead of one. So yeah, so this, th this scenario is favored and it also seems to be favored by the numerics, although uh, probably more study is necessary. How, how am I doing on time? Five. Five? Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, so in, in, in the remaining five minutes, let me very quickly um, talk about uh, the other problem, the other geometry, that of a defect plane. Um, so, all right, so same problem, but actually the phenomenology is a little bit different here. So here, you know, on this defect plane, I have this coupling K1, 
And there is one point where we know exactly what happens, which is when K1 is equal to K, right? That's the situation with no defect. And that situation just, well, just corresponds to a bulk ON model and uh, perturbing away from K1 equal to K just corresponds to uh, inducing the, you know, the phi squared operator or the, the thermal operator on this plane. And this is the relevant perturbation. So it's going to drive you away from, from this uh, K1 equal to K fixed point, but it's the only relevant perturbation at that point. So this is, this is actually the, the special fixed point in this case is K1 equal to K. So if you have the special fixed point, it's natural to assume that you know, different signs of uh, perturbation away from it will lead to different phases, um, which I think was not appreciated in the literature. Somehow people maybe thought that you have ordinary phase uh, on, both, on both sides uh, for n greater than two. But um, so, 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 so actually this is the natural phase diagram with the extraordinary phase being, being realized for any value of n. There is no, we don't expect a critical N in this case. And indeed that will be confirmed by RG analysis. So uh, what, are these, what are these fixed points for the, for, for, for the plane defect case? Well, the ordinary fixed point is quite simple. Um, this defect plane just cuts the system into two halves uh, and each of the ex exposed uh, boundaries now has an ordinary universality class and the coupling between them turns out to be irrelevant. Same with the normal fixed point. If I apply a symmetry breaking field on this plane, it just cuts the system into two uh, normal boundaries. And again, the coupling between these two boundaries is irrelevant. Now, what about, yeah. So, so for the Ising case, then the extraordinary uh, fixed point will be just the same as this norm. Now, what about um, for n greater or equal than two, right? So we have to write a theory which is along the same lines as, as I wrote for a semi-infinite system. But now the, the, the order parameter on this plane defect can couple to the tilt operators from both sides of the, of the interface. And because of that, there is this extra factor of two in the beta function here. And it turns out that uh, even when n goes to infinity, alpha remains positive. So alpha is expected to be positive here for any value of n, and the extraordinary log phase will be realized for any n greater or equal than two. Um, right, so the phase diagram is, is uh, as I said here. Now, something actually very interesting happens when n is equal to infinity in this model, in this plane defect, which is that this entire line becomes a line of fixed points. There is a um, there is a there is a exactly marginal boundary coupling at n equal to infinity, um, and the exponents on the boundary change as you change this uh, boundary coupling, which I parameterized uh, by mu here, running from zero to one. And then at one end of this uh, line, you have the ordinary; at the other one, you have well, extraordinary or normal. And then at mu equal one half, you have the special. And then the, the scaling dimensions on the boundary uh, change as you change mu. But this is only the case, you know, this is kind of special case n equal to infinity. Once you make n large but finite, um, you can calculate the flow of mu, the beta function for mu. Actually, you can calculate it to order one over n exactly. And we did this with Abi, kind of nice exercise. And turns out that uh, this, uh, line of fixed points is lifted to just ordinary special and well normal and then the approach to this normal is exactly this quadratic one that we expected from the other rg approach so this is a very non-trivial check of the rg that i described that works for any n and this large n calculation that only yeah only works for n large all right let's see so um, I guess I'm running out of time. There is this, um, yeah, so for these problems with the boundary, there is an analog of a, um, in two, we know that for two-dimensional CFT, there is the central charge and the central charge decreases monotonously under renormalization group flow. So for this, um, for this uh, problems with the boundary, there is some similar boundary central charge that increase, decreases monotonously under boundary RG flow. 
And for this line of fixed points, we were able to calculate this, um, this charge, but um, may, may, maybe I'll skip this part. So let me, let me conclude by saying that, uh, well, um, you know, the simple, the simplest classical stat Mac model, the ON model, actually the story of boundary criticality was not fully, not fully understood. Um, I think in the classical model, numerics, analytics, and um, conformal bootstrap are now converging, but there are, you know, there are, there are still things to understand, namely precise value of NC and, uh, yeah, and well, which of these two scenarios is realized. Uh, so more Monte Carlo and bootstrap, I think will be helpful, but uh, there are also quantum analogs of this, of this boundary uh, story that, uh, that there is a lot of Monte Carlo on, but which are not fully understood analytically. So, so that would be a separate story that unfortunately I do not have time for. Thank you. So I noticed that when you're talking about the boundary, you're only considering the homogeneous transitions in the in the in the Ising pneumatic iron based superconductors. There are these persistent claims that there's actually a surface smectic at temperatures above the Ising pneumatic transition. That would be like an n equal one because it's uh, fixed by Ising. Um, and uh, could this uh, could there be actually finite uh, momentum transitions which would go above? Finite. finite momentum so wave, density wave transitions that's what they're that's what they keep on claiming happens and it's not understood why in, in, in principle in, you know in a general microscopic model yes but uh in uh in this particular simple model no Well, well, this this is you know this is the same type of problem. This is the boundary conformal field theory, except in two dimensions. In well, in one plus one dimension, we know much more because of uh, Virasoro symmetry and because uh, uh, yeah. There are minimal models, and well, C equal one theories are essentially understood. In higher dimensions, it's much harder, right? So this is kind of even in the simplest StatMac model in three dimensions already. It's much harder to to even nail down the phase diagram. So this is kind of an attempt. Quarter. Yeah. But why is that plus minus 10 to minus? There is some integral that needs to be done. And this is the precision to which I was able to make the, to, to do the integral. Now, I, I, I suspect that it's actually four thirds. I, I wasn't able to do the integral analytically. Now in this, uh, in this uh, plane defect um, problem, you can also ask what is the G cubed term? And there we do know it analytically and it turns out to be five thirds. So I have a very strong suspicion that for this uh, semi-infinite geometry, it is exactly four thirds. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. If not, let's thank Max again. Hi. I guess there is a question in the chat. But... What about the quantum ones? Yeah, I don't know. We can, I can, I can maybe answer during the Q and A session. <laughs>